Well, thank you. It's nice to uh, be back up to, to speak again about prescription drug abuse in the United States. And I wanted, before I started, I'd like to uh, thank the, the organizers for arranging a unique French experience for me, which is the air traffic control strike. So I will be catching a train shortly, and, uh, and uh, so I will, ask, I will answer as any questions I can before I leave, and if, uh, if not, you can email me and I'll be happy to answer those. So let's move right into this. There we go. Uh, just again, to, I won't go into a lot of background here on the opioid epidemic in the United States. I'll just show a couple slides, um, I hope. There we go. I showed this yesterday, uh, just showing the increase in uh, deaths in the United States. Um, uh, today, uh, or in 2010, 11, uh, reached 16,000 deaths per year. Um, I then showed a slide from the United Kingdom, but tonight I'm going to show a slide from Australia, where we've also done some work with the Australian network of uh, poison centers. Uh, this shows intentional and unintentional exposure rates by opioid and by year. And you can, uh, the top line there, uh, dark line, solid line, is oxycodone, intentional exposures. Uh, the dotted line is unintentional. So the two together would represent all oxycodone exposures, and you can see that they've increased dramatically in uh, Australia as well as in the United States and many other countries. Interestingly, methadone and buprenorphine have been fairly flat uh, in Australia. Just more evidence that humans, people are people across, around the globe and they like opioids. Now, the, just to refresh your memory, the, the, the radar system is designed using what we call a mosaic strategy. Uh, and, and always for post-marketing surveillance. And the mosaic strategy relies on the, the, the fact that if you do one study, uh, you get one set of data, but that doesn't tell you the whole story. Prescription drug abuse is hidden by uh, people who abuse drugs, and so all you can get from a study is a piece of the picture. If you do another study, you can get another piece of the picture, but if you do enough studies, then hopefully you can get the whole picture which is of Michael Jackson, one of our favorite uh, drug abusers, former drug abusers in the United States. We have so many, I didn't know which picture to pick, but uh, um, again, last, this is my last refresher slide from, uh, from about radars. This is uh, how radars creates that mosaic picture, uh, trying to bring together multiple different data sources to form uh, a clear picture of of abuse and diversion. Again, we have the poison center system, uh, which gets acute health events, people who fall ill during the use of, a, of an opioid or a stimulant. That's one program. Another program is our drug diversion program, which is uh, law enforcement, uh, police departments around the United States submitting um, data on the people that they arrest and what drugs uh, that were involved in that arrest. A third system is the methadone, or OTP, opioid treatment programs, which are also called methadone programs, largely federally uh, supported. We have 73 programs, so these are people in substance abuse, in treatment for substance abuse. We have another very similar program called SKIP, Survey of Key Informant Patients. These, uh, SKIP has higher socioeconomic uh, patients. These are patients who are in the private system whereas the OTP system are primarily patients who are in the public system. We also do a survey, a web-based survey, of college students uh, three times a year, once every semester, asking them about the drugs that they're abusing, where they got them, how much they paid, that type of thing. And then finally, as I mentioned yesterday, we do the streetrx.com, which uh, asks, or well, allows abusers to enter the price of drugs that they paid uh, into a website. Uh, this is for people right now, and uh, we have separate systems for the US, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So, taking evidence from all these different sources and, even, and some from the literature as well, uh, I was asked to describe 
prescription drug abuse in the United States. Um, so which, which opioids are abused and diverted? Well, the answer, of course, the general answer is everyone. <laughs> Every prescription opioid is abused to some degree. Uh, this is a paper we produced several years ago uh, for, uh, through uh, Nab Dasgupta, one of our uh, researchers. And um, the purpose of this slide is to show that for every drug we have, the more drug that's available on the market, the more abuse there is. So you can look at hydrocodone and oxycodone there, uh, methadone in the lower right-hand corner, and morphine. Now one thing I want to point out here is that uh, morphine has a much more shallow uh, slope than the other three. And we don't know the reason for that, but it's very consistent that we find this. So as you increase morphine uh, sales, then you only get a slight increase in abuse, whereas if you, in, if you increase hydrocodone and oxycodone or methadone sales, then you get a very direct, almost one-to-one -one relationship with uh, increase in uh, diversion and abuse. Now this is a very busy slide, but I will explain it uh, to you. I've highlighted three drugs on here. One is oxymorphone in yellow, buprenorphine in orange, and methadone in red. Um, this slide shows 2011 and, and two, versus 2012 when we use population as a denominator. So what we've done here is we've taken the number of events in the poison center system, the opioid treatment system, and the drug diversion system and divided by the population of the same area that those reports came from. And you can see that when you do that, uh, hydrocodone and oxycodone uh, are the first two lines in every program. They're so available in the United States, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, and so they're just the most common drugs out there. That doesn't mean they're the most desirable drugs, it just means they're the most commonly abused or diverted drugs. And you can see methadone is in the middle, buprenorphine is uh, towards the bottom, and oxymorphone is at the bottom. Now, that's surprising because oxymorphone is a very potent opioid. Uh, and the population rate does not take into account the, the sales of the drugs. So if oxymorphone doesn't sell very much drug, uh, there aren't very many prescriptions written for it, then there's not that much drug to abuse. So we wanted to know, well, let's look at the desirability of drugs, not just which ones are abused. And we can do that by dividing by a different denominator. And that denominator is the number of people who filled a prescription for that drug. This is essentially the same as the number of prescriptions. You can see that that completely changes the landscape uh, for or the results. Because now we're measuring which drug do, pati do not patients, do abusers want to get versus which ones do they get, do they settle for, which was the previous slide. And you can see that we saw a huge shift in oxymorphone in 2011. I will show you the reason for that in a few minutes. Um, but it went from near the bottom in 2011 to number one in, uh, in two of the three systems and second in the other. Um, methadone also moves up and buprenorphine moves up. So these are, these are, uh, um, I've given you an example of three different systems, the drug diversion system, so that's the street activity. So methadone is, is definitely uh, uh, active on the street, as is oxymorphone and hydromorphone. Hydromorphone is uh, what we call dilaudid. Uh, in the opioid treatment in the center, um, methadone is number one. Uh, that's not too surprising. A lot of those patients are on methadone already. Uh, when they endorse methadone in this system, they're endorsing abuse of it in addition to their normal dose, but still, when you have a drug handy, it's very easy to abuse it. What surprised us, really, was that methadone becomes number one in the poison center system. Poison centers take calls from everybody. These are not specifically for drug abusers at all. Um, we think it's because of the long half-life of methadone causes more problems, and therefore, people who, uh, who experiment or, or abuse methadone are more likely to call the poison center because they're more likely to have health problems uh, acutely. <clears throat> another question is, well, another measure of the desirability of a drug is how much does it cost? I introduced this program yesterday and I won't spend much time, 
but this is a, that's that program I mentioned where you can use a crowdsourcing methodology. So people come spontaneously to a website uh, and enter the price for the drugs they paid. They do that because they can uh, find out how much drugs in that general area are selling for. It doesn't tell them specifically where they can buy the drug. It just says, uh, in, on, you know, in this zip, in this, uh, zip code, the, the going price is $1 per milligram or whatever it is. But that seems to be enough. We get many, many hits on this site. Um, and we can look at data like this, which was just published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research this year, uh, to show that um, uh, StreetRx is the middle bar on these. And, and this was a validation study, but you can see that the price ranges from hydromorphone on the left here, uh, really about a little over $3 per milligram, so um, quite expensive. Buprenorphine is about $2 per milligram. That's all buprenorphine combined, so that includes Suboxone and Subutex combined. Um, oxymorphone, you can see there's about $1.50. Methadone is about $1. Oxycodone, $1. Hydrocodone, $1 and morphine is, uh, is the cheapest. So it's, it's very interesting how the prices do seem to correlate quite well with the, um, the, de the, the desirability of the drug on the market. Excuse me. We can take that to another step. We collect product specific. So product specific data means we can get the price on a specific product on the market. In this case, I'm showing you data from Opana ER which is oxymorphone, and oxycontin, which is oxycodone. Um, the reason I'm showing these two is we detected a difference when the, both of these products went through a phase where they switched from crushable, I'm sorry, crushable is the lower one, and um, hard to crush is the upper one. So easy to snort to a formulation that was very hard to snort or sniff. Um, you can see that for Opana, the price today of the old one has gone up to $1.38 per milligram, uh, whereas the new one that's hard to crush is about a third less. So you can, you can actually see market economic dynamics going on here where consumers are pricing the products where they value them uh, and the hard to crush uh, drugs are about a third uh, less than the easy to crush uh, versions of the same drugs. Uh, you may have heard, I mentioned it yesterday, but you, you may have heard of this uh, uh, system called Silk Road, where you could go on, this is a screenshot from Silk Road. Uh, Silk Road is very difficult to get on, it's now closed, but uh, the, F, I'm sorry, the, um, FBI just announced that they had closed this site. It, it operated for several years, actually, and you could buy really any illegal, um, any illegal substance you wanted. It was quite remarkable. And uh, the FBI shut that down last week, so very uh, cutting edge uh, news. So if you were using Silk Road, I'm sorry, you won't be able to use that anymore. <laughs> but uh, so Silk Road is one place that uh, people can get uh, drugs. We were never sure how many people use Silk Road because, of course, the operators weren't, re weren't releasing that information. But we can ask the patients or the abusers where they get their drug. And this is uh, data from two of our programs where we ask that every three months, we ask that of, of, uh, of new patients coming into those programs. On the left bar here, you can see that that's the college survey. So these are people in college, university, uh, and uh, not, typically not very experienced drug abusers. And then the methadone program, of course, is people who are addicted and usually have pretty hardcore uh, drug uh, abuse. Uh, I'd like you to look at the yellow and green bands. Uh, yellow represents theft. So these people endorsed that they were stealing uh, at least some of their drug. And you can see, of course, in the college survey, not too much stealing goes on. They mostly get it from friends and relatives, or they get it from their doctor. Um, in the, uh, if you go to the methadone program, though, you can see that uh, the yellow is much bigger, so there's a lot more theft. 
The green is a lot thicker, so they purchased it illegally. Um, and you can also see that all the bands are actually, I mean, the total column uh, adds up more, so that means that each individual abuser is utilizing more sources uh, to get their drug. And it just makes sense, it's not real surprising, but as a person gets more and more addicted, then they, they can't get it from their family as much or their friends and relatives, and they switch to these other sources which are more reliable because they can either steal it, they can, they can buy it on the street. Um, one thing that's always surprised us is that hardly anyone endorses the, uh, the internet. And we don't know why that is. We know the internet is used, but there is some evidence in the U.S. that the internet is used more for trafficking between dealers, not from a dealer to the user. And so it may be that when they buy the drug um, illegally, that dealer actually got the drug through the internet, um, but we don't know that for sure. And that's, that's the thought that that's how Silk Road uh, uh, operated. Well, where do diversion and abuse occur in the United States? Now, this is very complicated. I'm just going to explain a couple things, so don't, don't get worried. Um, so the, the basic message here is we can look at every three-digit zip code in the United States. There's 973 different three-digit zip codes in the United States. Every single one has cases of prescription drug abuse reported to us. There, is no, there are no exceptions. So very prevalent, very prevalent problem. Certain states stand out. Now, what this graph does is one of our, uh, one of our uh, analytic experts had this very creative way. This figure collapses all the data from all the programs together and puts it into tertiles. So upper tertile, third, middle tertile, one third, bottom tertile, lowest third. And you can see that's here at the bottom. So the darker the color, the worse it is. If you look at the first red circle, I keep pointing at the wrong place, the red circle up here, that's Alaska, very well known for drug abuse, low population though, but, but high drug abuse, and you can see they're actually in the upper third for every single drug listed. Those drugs are um, hydrocodone, oxycodone, this includes tramadol, fentanyl, morphine, methadone, hydromorphone, and buprenorphine. Every, they're up there for every single one. Uh, my state, which is, uh, my state, which is Colorado here, uh, is really in the middle. It's not one of the highest states. Uh, Utah is high, Minnesota's high, West Virginia's high. Um, uh, then you can also start to dissect out patterns. So if you look at this pattern here, where you have all these dark circles, you can see that the northeastern United States really likes methadone. They also like buprenorphine, and that was a well-known uh, trend that was noticed several years ago. Um, if you look at the states of Kentucky, Mississippi, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan, you can see they really like extended release oxycodone and some immediate release. They like a lot of everything, basically, but they, the oxycodone, uh, eastern Kentucky is, is well-renowned for its oxycodone abuse. So uh, the map really starts to bear out a lot of lessons if you want to, uh, if you want to focus on the geography of prescription drug abuse. Well, how do people abuse these? Uh, you won't be surprised, I'll go, I'll go over this quickly, which is people early in the course of their abuse, such as college students, it's almost, they 98% endorse oral, a few snort it, um, and very few inject it, whereas if you go to OTP and skip, where we have very, you know, people who have gone into treatment, often been court ordered into treatment, uh, you can see that now over half of them uh, uh, endorse IV injection. Hmm. Hello, there we go. Uh, this is just another uh, 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 from Nat, Nat, uh, Nat Katz uh, in Boston, did a study as well and shows the same thing basically that when people come into, when their initial route of abuse is almost always oral, uh, but then when they get to treatment, they're uh, largely IV. Now I had one story I wanted to tell you that, that's been, become very controversial in the United States. Uh, has led to many FDA meetings and a lot of newspaper headlines. And that has to do with this reformulation that I was mentioning. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit more detail about that. 
So the idea is that one possible solution to prescription drug abuse is to prevent people from processing the pill, to prevent them from changing it to a powder that they can uh, solubilize for IV injection or that they can snort. And so one approach is to make hard coatings so it's very hard uh, to do that. Another is to take a po make the drug, embed the drug in a polymer that gets uh, viscous, uh, gel uh, gelatin-like, so that you can't snort it or inject it. When you try, um, so you would get things like this. If you look at the syringe here, you can see this stringy stuff that you can't suck up. For you guys in the front here, it's down here. <laughs> um, so that spoon at the top is actually the old Oxycontin, where it's not a great solution. You can still see particulates there, but the bottom solution, there's just no way to suck that up into a syringe. Um, another is to uh, put it in a polymer that resists dissolving. In other words, it's not water soluble. That's of limited use because addicts certainly have no problem finding other solvents. Um, yet other ones that have been uh, tried are nasal tissue irritants, in other words, putting a, a, a chemical like capsaicin into the tablet so that if they snorted it, it caused burning. Um, that was actually, that's been tried, but was actually re re rejected by the US FDA. And there's new delivery systems coming of all kinds. It's a very fertile market in the United States. And there's probably at least 20 or 30 different manufacturers right now who are trying to create a new, better uh, formulation to try to reduce uh, abuse. Uh, abuse. Not to leave in time. Yep. A um, couple, uh, so what happens, so what happened was Oxycontin and Opana, Oxycontin's on the left, Opana on the right, and what these graphs show, there's just a couple, but they show before the abuse deterrent formulation came in and then after. And you can see, this is just the number of people who filled a prescription. This has no abuse in it. Well, it could be abuse, but it's not specifically abuse. It's just how many sales. And you can see that after the introduction of the abuse deterrent formulations, sales went down for both drugs. So that tells us right now that a substantial portion of that drug was purely for substance abuse. The people don't even want it anymore if they can't abuse it. Uh, again, showing Oxycontin and Opana. This is drug diversion. You can see before for Oxycontin, we're here, and this shows the marked decrease, about a 60% decrease right now, 60 to 70 uh, decrease for Oxycontin, while other opioids have been unchanged. So very convincing evidence that, at least for that one product, the abuse deterrent formulation works. Now, I'm, I don't have time to show you all the data, but there are data, unfortunately, that shows that people are switching to other drugs. It, they don't just stop, of course. This, these are opioids. Uh, this is the same uh, data for Poison Center. I won't go into detail because it's the same exact pattern as we saw in the drug diversion program. So acute health events called to Poison Centers have gone down about 50% after the introduction of these abuse deterrent. We've also seen a, a bigger decrease in what we call unintended routes of, abu of, uh, of administration. So that would be IV and snorting in combined versus the intended route on the left, which is oral. So you can see a bigger decrease in the alternate routes of abuse. Um, and then if we look at treatment programs, very interesting pattern because if you look here for Oxycontin, actually for both of them, you'll see here it is, it's actually going up some before the introduction of the new product, but then initially it does not go down for what, two quarters, so this is six months, there's no change, and then suddenly it starts to go down. We've got data that shows that this appears to be related to the amount of drug available on the street market. So these people know where to get their drug, they could still get it after it was switched, but then after about six months they couldn't get it anymore because they had used it all up, and then the, 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 their endorsement of it began to fall. And then last, uh, next to last slide, I think, is the Poison Center program. This is to show that squeezing of the balloon uh, issue. Here, for Oxycontin, you can see the same, the same data. Oxycontin's going up. The new Oxycontin comes in, and we get this decrease, which has been persistent. But then, when this decreased, what happened here? Opana increased. And the reason is, is that Opana, during this time, was crushable. So people just switched from one crushable drug 
to another crushable drug. And then after Opana came out with a non-crushable formulation, you can see that they decreased as well. So it's a great example of what patients do to us, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call them patients, abusers do to us, is that they switch to the drug that uh, they can use to uh, get their high. So in conclusion, I'll just say that, as I mentioned, <coughs> prescription drug abuse is everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. Hydrocodone and oxycodone are the most common, but actually oxymorphone and methadone are the most desired by, uh, by in the U.S. at least. Uh, and the U.S. is different in methadone. I under, definitely understand that because there's a lot more pills for pain than there are in other countries. The abuse deterrent formulations do seem to be effective, but they raise another question, which is, is the bang worth the buck? In other words, they cost a lot more, and if people just switch to other things, then have we really accomplished anything? That remains to be seen, and various organizations like the state attorneys generals and the FDA are holding hearings about this uh, as we speak. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer a couple of questions if we can. Qui veut poser une question à M. Dart avant qu'il ne s'en aille Pas de question Ah, oh, pardon, excusez-moi. Thank you. Um, in your presentation, you talk about prescription abuse is in all countries. But it's my understanding that um, when medications are prescribed, they can be used as prescribed or misused, meaning not used as prescribed, or abused taken for the effect only. It seems to me that, based on what you presented, that nobody is misusing any prescribed medications. They're only abusing. That's... Uh You've, you've interpreted, you've, you've reflected the presentation correctly, but I want to clarify that for, for sake of time, I haven't presented misuse data. Okay. So we do have categories for misuse, and misuse actually um, is clearly a significant part. In the U.S., I think roughly the same. Misuse is defined as using the drug in a way different than prescribed, but for an indication like pain, uh, whereas abuse in our questionnaires is always to get to get high, as you mentioned. Okay, so therefore, do you think misuse is more likely than abuse? Uh, well, in the populations, um, well, in our treatment populations, no, because they're, that's why they're there, of course, is abusing. In drug diversion, we sort of assume that's abuse. We don't have proof that it's abuse because people have gone to the effort uh, and gotten and to, to uh, buy it on the street and ended up arrested. Uh, although for buprenorphine in particular, we're, we're quite aware that there are people pursuing, they're pursu in the U.S. it's hard to get, it's uh, somewhat hard to get buprenorphine treatment, and therefore they will try to buy it on the street to treat, self-treat their withdrawal until they can get into a program. Uh -huh. So buprenorphine I think is an exception, but for most of the other drugs, um, it does seem that they're buying it to get high. Now in the poison center system, uh, it's true that uh, we have a misuse category and an abuse category. Um, abuse is higher, but misuse is pretty high too, so they're similar. Je suis désolé de ne pas accepter d'autres questions, mais je vais demander à M. Dart de prendre son taxi maintenant, s'il veut avoir son train. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.